So I basically had three family members in hospital and three kids at home and a company to run. And I quickly realized there's no way I can do this all. I'd say this industry is, is, is quite traditional, doesn't always move very fast. But I think in many roles, actually, this industry could benefit from uh, uh, a fresh pair of eyes. So I, I really believe in the power of vulnerability. And if you can own up to your mistakes and own up to them in public, huge sign of strength. Our climates and our planets, that's devastating. You know, so when I think about my children and grandchildren, I am concerned. Welcome to Sports and Outdoor Mentors. In this episode, I talked to Greg Newenhaus, the chairman of Mammut and Wattbike. Mammut employs more than 700 people around the world, is sold in more than 30 countries, and in 2022 generated revenue in excess of 300 million euros. We chat about his competitive nature and how that impacts him professionally. We talk about the challenges he faced when leading the Snellenrock and Cotswold business in the UK, and how prioritizing his family has changed his career path, plus much, much more. But before we jump in, I have one favor to ask. Please hit the subscribe button. It helps us to continue to grow the channel, elevate the content, and attract even more great leaders within the sports and outdoor industry to share their insights with you. So enjoy the episode, and thanks very much for your support. Greg, so in doing my research, listening to all your previous interviews, reading a lot of things about you, it's clear that you're super competitive. So first of all, probably in sport, whether it is swimming, field hockey, ski mountaineering, trail running, and then obviously in business, clearly very determined, very ambitious. But also at the same time, you seem to have generally really throughout your career put your family you know, first, which I think a lot of people say it, but I think it's quite difficult to do sometimes, especially in senior roles. So how have you managed to get that balance right? And and why is that so important for you, that balance? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, well, I think that's um, what you said is not entirely true. I said I've not always put my family first. And as you say, I am um, very competitive. I am very dedicated. I have a lot of uh, grit. I don't give up. And that has a lot of positive, um, you know, positive benefits. Um, but it probably also caused me to at times get carried away with work. I just, I just never give up, and I hone in and hone in. And it took me, um, I would say, probably a, a life-changing experience <clears throat> to realize that I, I could do things differently. So when in 2019 we already had three kids lived in the UK, I was at the time CEO of Cotswold Outdoor and Stone Rock, and my wife. Um, by accident got pregnant, pregnant, turned out to be twins, and they were born early. And uh, 28 weeks, the youngest was 850 grams, and um, they spent um, two and a half months in uh, intensive care, and then after that went home on oxygen bottles. But then we kept going back and forth to a hospital for all the time. So I basically had, and my wife at the same time also got very ill, so she, her, both her arms got paralyzed. So I basically had three family members in hospital and three kids at home and a company to run and I quickly realized there's no way I can do this all um, and of course I need a lot of attention so you know we agreed that I, that I would leave at the time and I basically spent an, a year and a half at home looking after the kids looking after my wife just trying to um, yeah trying to take a step forward with the family and it was kind of you know a survival mode and at the time, I realized, first of all, that, you know, when, you know, the things that are most important in, in life are you take for granted until you don't have them. And that's the health of your, your beloved ones. Um, and it's funny, as, as, as every day as the boys got a little bit better, you start to worry about new, smaller, less important problems. And um, that's just how the, the brain, or at least my brain works. But the second thing is because I was at home uh, during those 18 months, I saw that there was a, a world um, of things going on in my children's lives that I wasn't really aware of. And simple things like, you know, you know, on which day they had pee at school, and, you know, maybe that's easy when you have one or two, but when you have five, it's a bit more. And and I realized that um, also because of that experience that they've gone through, which was quite traumatic for them, um, it would be um, a good thing for me to, to, to be much more present at home. And I... 
I was tempted to go back into a, a role as a CEO, but I realized that it would be unlikely for me to be able to find the right balance also because I'm because of that grit and competitiveness. I yeah, I just kind of I don't give up and I continue. And strangely enough, you know, when there's a when there's a kind of a a collision of of priorities, sometimes it's easier to choose for work than uh, than for family. So I decided that I wanted to shape my career in a different way, where I'd be much more flexible, um, and 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 have more time um, and flexibility to, to be with my kids. And and it's been amazing, to be honest. I've I've um, I'm very very grateful for kind of that that um, that experience in hindsight, because you know the boys are now healthy and they're thriving. Um, but I'm not not 100% sure if I would have done it otherwise, or maybe I would have done it a bit less and a bit later. Um, but I'm 43, um, and seeing my kids grow grow up for much quicker is uh, is a huge privilege. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, great. Well, it's uh, I think it it takes a lot of uh, a lot of guts, I'm sure, as well to to take that decision and and to do what you've done. I think many people that get into the type of senior positions that you've been in are <coughs> clearly so driven by what they do to to take that decision is 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 not easy at all so congratulations it's a i think it's something i'm sure uh, i'm sure you could be proud of and i'm sure your family anyway are, are super super thankful for thank you i mean in a way, in a way it's difficult but in, in the other in the other hand it's not because why would you know, also ambitious leaders want to be extremely demanding in their work, but set a lower standard um, at home. And you know, maybe some people don't do that. But I just realized for me, um, also having five kids, I, I just needed to have a different setup to be able to give home the right right attention. In the past, you've mentioned that when you were the CEO of uh, O and CC, or is it OC and yeah, O. Oh no, no. Oh, I've been at both, but I'm yeah, exactly. You have ONCC, ONCC. Thank you. Cycle content. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I should have just said Cotswold and Stone Rock. It would have been easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You said that at that time that was one of the toughest challenges you've had, kind of professionally. So, when you look back on that time, what did you? Maybe first, why was it so difficult? And and kind of reflecting back on those difficult times, what do you take away from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was challenging for a number of reasons. I mean, it was my second experience as a CEO. The first one was at, at Bever, when uh, where I went into very inexperienced, but that was a, a, um, a really a, a big success where I had probably a lot of luck and 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 some some right decisions. Um, at Kosovo, I think externally the situation was quite difficult. It was we arrived, we I moved to the UK just after the just before the the referendum. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, Amazon was becoming very dominant in the high street. Uh, property costs were extremely high. And then not long after that, uh, JD bought Get Go Outdoors and became quite aggressive in the price strategy. Um, so from an external, the external environment was tough. Internally, Cotswold had just acquired Stone Rock. And uh, that turned out to be a much more complicated integration than was foreseen. Uh, the cycling industry um, was very hot when we bought the business, so Stone Rock with cycle surgery, but that had also kind of completely uh, fallen off the cliff. So that became very difficult. Um, and then I think also culturally, the um, to kind of get Cotswold Cot and Stone Rock to work together was also a little bit more complicated than people had um, initially expected. And then on top of that, I think for me, Coming from the Netherlands, um, I am quite direct um, and used to working in a quite direct um, culture where people people are open, uh, share their feedback honestly, um, and that that's probably one of the things I found the most difficult is that I realized that when I came into this role, it took me about a year to find out what the real situation was. So I kept on digging deeper and finding you know, more negative stories. Um, and I was probably initially very disappointed in the people I was working with, saying, you know, why have you not opened up 
to me about these problems? Who were you trying to fool? Is mm -hmm. it me or yourself? Or, But then I realized I was just mostly also very um, disappointed myself for not having seen that culture shift and differences earlier because what people say is not necessarily what they're trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you look back at that, at that, at that time, what do you kind of take from that? I mean, you're you're now you're now chairman of Mabu, but you were also at one point CEO. So, um, were you able to take any of that experience from ONCC and kind of bring those learnings here? Absolutely. I, I think that you know at Bever, I was 31 when I became CEO of Bever. Um, so I, you know I made I made loads of mistakes, and that helped me um, learn very quickly. Um, but as I said, that was in the end a very positive journey. Um, the journey in the UK being much tougher, I think maybe I learned even more. Um, and there's definitely a story here again about grit. Um, I think on the culture side, I think that was very enlightening for me where it really created a, a strong desire and passion for me to understand international cultures. Um, and that's been very relevant at Mammoth where we're here based in Switzerland, um, but we have businesses, sizable businesses in Japan and China and the US and kind of creating um, uh, a platform where those teams can can work together and be successful is something I really enjoy about kind of understanding the cultures and the history of those countries and then therefore how, you know, what is the best modus operandi for, uh, for those, um, uh, you know, to, to have those people work together. But it was also very much around, you know, cost reductions, managing cash, it's a situation that I'd been, you know, less forced to, to be involved with before, which I learned a lot from. Um, but probably also to, you know, I think when you when you get into a job, to a job, I'm always thinking about opportunities and what can be done. But I think sometimes. You probably can be a bit more honest to yourself about what the the real issues of the business are. And as I said, it took me too long to realize um, what kind of situation the business was in. So I think that you know that wouldn't happen to me again in that way. So during that same time, you were also uh, on the board of the OAA in the UK, so the Outdoor Industry Association yep. in the UK. So what drove you to to take on that extra responsibility and support the OAA and 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 what was your role uh, as a member of the board yeah yeah that was a pretty easy decision um very easy actually i joined the outdoor industry um because i love the outdoors um uh, i'm you know as you said in the intro i love mountains um i love uh ski mountaineering i love ultra running i love running i love cycling and I just basically very simply believe anyone who spends more time outside is a happier person and a healthier person and also a person who takes better care of the environment. Um, so for me, you know, there's, there's the, a huge part of taking you know, this career is around doing something I'm passionate about and also doing something that I know is good for, um, for people. Um, and that's what the OIA stands for. Um, so I thought that aside from the role at Cotswold, there's a responsibility to, to society where I can have a positive impact. And the other element is just that Andrew Denton is, is an amazing character and, um, you know, it was so much fun to work with him and the other board members. Um, so that, yeah, that, that was a very easy decision. Um, and I think the OA has put a good standard on a lot of elements that are also can be, um, uh, can be and have been um, exported to uh, to other countries um, outside of the UK. So I'm 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 very proud of what the OAA has achieved. Who are the people that have most influenced you professionally? Would you say? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah, the first person that probably comes to mind is is um, Frederick Hufkins. He is the CEO of Yonderland or the AS Adventure Group. And he initially hired me as head of strategy in M&A when I came from uh, my consulting uh, career from OCNC. And when I was 31, he promoted me to CEO of Bayer. And I remember he called me on a Friday afternoon and said, "Look, we, you know, do you want to become the CEO?" And I 
didn't see that coming at all. There's no way I was expecting him to call me. And initially, I thought that's definitely a risk. If I was him, that's definitely a risk I would not be prepared to take. Um, so I thought maybe I should just not do it. And then I thought about it for about 48 hours and then realized, of course I will. This is too good of an opportunity, too good of a company. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why he is doing this. So I am very grateful for that, for, for that, um, that opportunity. Uh, yeah, he's probably, uh, funnily enough, probably the, the most influential. Then there's been a lot of people who I've worked with in my teams. Um, one of them is, is perhaps, uh, Peter Salmon, who was the CEO of Bever. Um, after me, I hired him as initially as director of e-commerce and then he became, um, omnichannel director and then he became marketing omnichannel director. And when I left Bever, he became uh, the CEO of Bever. And now he's, he's also moved on and we also worked at OCNT together. So we've done a lot of work uh, together. So he, he would also be one of them. Um, but I think probably in each of the roles I've done, I've always been very inspired by some of the people I've worked with. And I have to say in the case of Mahmoud, you know, the, the, yeah, there is something very special, um, about this company and everyone in the outdoor industry is very passionate about what they do and often the place they work for. But I've found that Mahmoud, there is a special edge to, to, to that. And maybe it's the heritage. It's the Swiss pride, it's the proximity to the mountains, but I have a lot of respect for, for the people I've worked with. And, and I have to say also in this case, the shareholders of, um, of Mahmoud who I've worked with have been awesome partners to, to work with. So I'm also very, very, very grateful for, uh, for their support. Great. Yeah. I, uh, as you said, the heritage, I'm sure I don't even know a fraction, but I mean, for a brand that's what, 161 yep. years old, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just looking around this beautiful showroom that we're in today, it's clear that, you know, the even though the product of course moves on every year, every season, but you know, you can still somehow feel um that heritage, I think, um, within the business. So yes, yeah. it's, it's it's great to see. That's great to see. One of the things, one of the questions I get asked a lot is actually by people from outside uh, of the sports and outdoor industry that that are desperate to get into the sports and outdoor industry uh, and they often struggle to do that what's what's your perspective on on bringing people in from from outside the industry is that something that you avoid or that you're you're open to <laughs> you know, some people are that oh you know it needs to be somebody from within and others are more open so what's your perspective on that yeah I, I definitely don't have a black and white view on that I think it's very situational I think in some roles it's for me, quite obvious that it needs to be someone from the industry. And that could be, for example, you know, we've just hired someone here at Mammoth for a, a head of commercial, head of Central Europe. Uh, so we'll be dealing, you know, responsible for all the turnover in Central Europe and therefore relationships um, with the B2B accounts are critical. Yeah. And therefore you're very likely to come up with someone who has experience in the industry. Um, but I'm, I think for many roles, it can be very beneficial to bring someone, someone in from the outside. I came in from the outside, you know, one day, um, and I have to admit it wasn't very easy. So, but I think it was my perseverance and grit that I was just like, I don't care how many people I have to meet. I'm just going to keep having coffee with people and it'll happen suddenly. And it did. And then it, it went very quickly, but I think in many roles, actually this industry could benefit from, uh, uh, a fresh pair of eyes. And I'd say this industry is, is, is quite traditional, um, doesn't always move very fast. So I think sometimes bringing in that talent from the from from the outside can be very beneficial, and you can see it in the in the top team of Mammoth. We have some people like uh, Paul Cosgrove, who's been in the industry all his career. He's in in product, but then we have quite a few others who have not. And I think if you can kind of get that mix right, that's when I think the magic can happen. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. I think as an industry, we need to continually innovate, and I think if it's the same people that are just moving around between the brands and the retailers, it's tough to do that. So I think injecting that with new talent from outside the industry is, is really important for sure. Yes. But I think you're, I also fully agree that it's tough to do. Um, and so I think your point about that determination and grit and ultimately not giving up is, is crucial. Um, and I think that's something that 
people need to understand that it it is a more conservative industry by mm -hmm. somehow almost by nature um so yeah that that determination is absolutely necessary otherwise it's tough to to get those opportunities well like you i've had a lot of people who approach me and say look i you know it's so cool that you've been able to make uh, your career uh you know out of your passion and i would like to do that how can i do that and i always say well that's exactly the most important part is that passion if you have that passion and you people can see that passion things will come to you if you if you're willing and daring to pursue it yeah absolutely absolutely so a slightly different tack here um how's your relationship with technology it's uh i'd say it's mixed sometimes i feel like i'm a bit of a dummy with uh, certain things on, you know, on my kids, learning stuff from widgets from my kids. Um, but I think overall I'm I'm very pro-technology and I've always been. So when I was at Baver, I was a huge evangelist at the time of omnichannel retailing. Um, and in 2011, you know, we didn't have a transactional website. And two years later, we won a number of awards for best omnichannel retailer of the year. So that was, you know, that was very gratifying. And then I spent some time in the um, on the east coast of the U.S. at Singularity University to learn about lots of exponential technologies. And recently, I've been doing a lot of work with AI. So I'm at, I'm very passionate about technology and the impact that it has. And you know, AI in in, in to, today I think is at the, at the same time very scary um, and very inspiring. Um, and part of me believes that. You know, sometimes the world world would be better off without the technologies, but unfortunately, that's never going to happen. Um, so I think the main question is how to make the most of it for your business um, and your life with a positive impact. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of technology. And and so how do you do that? How what's your approach to to using technology to positively impact your life? Um, well, if, if we if we bring it to business, I mean, I think the key thing is that you know AI, uh, as an example, um, the technology behind it is 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 amazing, but that doesn't really matter so much anymore. It's really around the interface of how are business leaders going to use AI to benefit their business, and usually that's by looking at consumer issues, consumer problems. Um, you know, right? people say the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business solutions. So if you if there is a problem around you know a product or a material that's not good enough or whatever it can be um in a lot of cases today technology can be your best friend and helping to solve that 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 problem um but the scary thing about ai is that also there'll be it's so accessible um and so easy to use that there'll be many people using it which don't necessarily have um i would say uh, positive enhan enhancements um uh in mind uh, and we'll also have to, to to learn to deal with that. You mentioned earlier on um, Frederick, who'd been a strong influence through you in your career. In addition to Frederick, have you ever worked with a mentor or a coach? Yes, I have. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm the I'm I'm. For me, I think having the, I've had a few mentors. Some of them kind of long-standing relationships over different roles. Um, and these have usually been kind of very experienced uh, business leaders who um, I initially reached out to and kind of maybe saw in me potential and were like, okay, I'm quite happy to continue to spend some time with this person. But I, especially in the role as a CEO, I have found it extremely beneficial to have a sparring partner. And sometimes the business coaches have been more around people and how do you kind of manage, manage your emotions and kind of the more the emotional side. And some of the coaches have been much more on the business side, and some of them have been kind of, you know, in between. But uh, I am a big fan of mentors and, and and coaches. Yes, and I mean it's part of part of the growing. For me, that really helps me accelerate my growth. Okay, interesting. And is that something that so the mentors? Obviously, it sounds like it is. It's something that you've proactively sought out yourself. It's not something that has come about by by working. Uh, at OCNC or or here, it's something that you've kind of personally always sought out yourself. Yes, absolutely, hundred hundred percent from from myself. Okay, that's where I think it needs to come from. You might be lucky in your career and work in a place where they suddenly offer the opportunity, but even then, 
that's only going to happen if if the drive comes from from within within yourself. And is it uh, is it that sparring partner the the main benefit, or is there anything else that you that you get out of those relationships? Well, I think sometimes it's a sparring partner. Sometimes it's it's just seeing different views, um, where maybe you're being challenged by people or challenged, uh, and that some sometimes people in your team won't be doing that. To be honest, that's still my preferred scenario. Is if there is enough trust and confidence in the team, then people will, will challenge you also in public. But that's again my Dutch style. You know, in many cultures, that you you can't expect that from people, um, and I still find that difficult sometimes to to accept that. Um, but it can also be around leveraging someone's experience and network. You know, there's so much experience, and um, sometimes certain situations explained to other people, you can get a very a different view by leveraging that experience mm. or network. What do you, I mean, maybe you just touched on it, but what do you struggle with professionally? <coughs> um, well, I think, I think it's, um, I think initially when I left OCNC as a consultant and then became CEO at Bever, I really struggled to accept that people did not have the same ethos as I did. Um, weren't prepared to work. 12 or 15 hours a day, um, weren't self-motivated. And my initial response to that was to just do the work myself. Um, and that was, of course, a tough lesson, which didn't go very far. Um, so that's something that, that I struggled with very early in my career. Um, I've, I hope that I've become a little bit better at it. I think the, the other piece I struggle is when people have a, have a, an opinion of you uh, or might disagree with a decision but not be open about it but then complain about it later I just find that very very frustrating because I feel that it really hampers progress um, so that's probably a bit of a blind spot for me if uh, that's something I find difficult to uh, to uh, to accept and I think the other one is mediocrity you know I, I kind of I uh, and I'll, I've probably gotten better at this. My my standards were, I think, much higher or much less accepting earlier on. I probably was much more looking at the output of what people were doing and less at the person and the circumstances and the reasons why perhaps mm-hmm. their performance wasn't, you know, according to my expectations. Um, so, I, so I have softened up a lot in that respect in, in a good way. But I do expect people to, 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 to be honest and, and, and do their best. The the second thing you mentioned there around being frustrated by people not necessarily being up front with you around uh, a disagreement in a point of view or opinion or whatever it might be. How do you how do you address that? Because I'm sure it's something that is is ongoing. I mean, there's always going to be people that are going to disagree. Yeah, um, which I think is good. Um, but how do you <laughs> how do you try and deal with that? How do you try and manage that situation? Because I think probably there's quite a few people there that struggle with that same thing. Yes. I mean, again, here it probably varies a lot across cultures. So if I'm going to talk about that in Japan or in the Netherlands, it's going to be a very different conversation. But usually it's about being honest and about setting expectations and... When I'm in a role, it's usually, you know, for example, at Mammoth, one of the things I did in the first weeks is to explain who I am, my style, my preferences, and also some things that are maybe not so easy about me. Um, and just to be very clear that I expect people to, to step up and to, I encourage debate at the, you know, within the management team, and I encourage people to disagree with me. Also in public, they don't have to, you know, make a huge source around it, just just say what you think. and um, But then it's also around when it does happen, how do you respond? And then you're actually showing people that is that is okay what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Because that's probably also early in my career, I may have encouraged people, but then my competitive nature was around to go into a debate and maybe try and win the debate, which clearly, if that's what you're doing as a CEO, you're not winning. So you, you touched on earlier on the culture and I wanted to talk a little bit today about 
building a business or building businesses with a people-centric culture and it, it sounds like you've been personally on somewhat of a journey through your 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 career on this topic um so why for you is that that people-centric culture kind of almost what you were just describing why do you feel that that's so important yeah i mean this is going to sound uh, very blasé but i if you know, I, I would I would feel very uncomfortable if I was the CEO. Probably a little bit less so the chairman because I feel slightly less accountable for it. But that's not entirely true. That people don't wake up in the morning feeling exciting to going, going to work. And if they feel like going to work is a chore um, or pays the bill, then why bother? You know, then probably this should not be the right place for you. Then you know, mum was in Switzerland and. You know, we I think we have a lot of exciting things that about the jobs we offer. But I think every leader has to ask himself, how do I create the excitement, the motivation, the passion for these people to treat this business as if it was their own? That's really, I think if you're not working towards that goal, why bother come to work mm. as a CEO or as an employee? Or, um, you know, that's a lot about empowering people, it's about challenging them. It's about rewarding them. It's about being open about your mistakes. It's about you know allowing people to innovate and and make mistakes. So I think those things are very, uh, very, very important. Um, and one of the things I've enjoyed a lot of Mammut is actually to see that doing those things is not always done in the same way through through across different cultures. Picking up on one of those points is about being open about mistakes. I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense. But how do you, what's your approach to <laughs> encourage that type of behavior, either in your your senior leadership team or the, the C-suite or even the people more more junior members of the team? What's, so which specific trait are you talking about? The uh, being open about mistakes, yeah. about mistakes that you're making. Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's obviously a topic that many businesses struggle with and um, there's probably no perfect way. Um, but again, here, I think you can explain to people why it is important to make mistakes and it is even more important to, when you make a mistake, to own up to a mistake. Um, that's the easy part, the saying. The doing is usually where, you know, it doesn't always happen the right way, is people will look at what you do, not what you say, so when people make mistakes and they own up to it, what is the organization going to do? Mm -hmm. Are they going to celebrate the mistake, take the, the learnings and apply them to a new project? Or are they going to try and scapegoat someone, understand what went wrong, who went wrong? So I, mean, I think that difference is, is, is very important. Um, and yeah, I think in the heat of the moment, it's, it's, it sounds very logical, but in the heat of the moment, it's not always that easy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, again, there's a task for a leader there to kind of obstruct oneself from the situation, look at it from a bit further, and then seeing that, you know, that, that mistake is a blessing that the business can learn from and move on from. Mm. And I think there, you know, putting up your hand, which happened earlier this year, he had my as well. I put up my hand in the board meeting and said, look, you know, that's, that's on me. I should have seen this. We all should have seen this. Um, but that's not what it's about here. How are we going to move forward? So I think sometimes as a leader, you can just put up your hand and take the blame, which naturally takes a bit of the pressure and the fear out of the room. You know, and then people can kind of settle uh, into their you know nervous systems and 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 think rather than feel lots of fear. And I, I sense that's something that you're, even if it's maybe not natural, because I think probably it's not natural for anyone, but you're comfortable to do because again, in the research I've done. You know, you're you're open about when things have been difficult, when things haven't mm -hmm. worked out. Why do you think that is? What are, why have you got to this stage where you're able to just say, okay, yeah, well, as you just described, you know, you mm -hmm. lift your hand up and say, yeah, I screwed up or whatever it yeah. might be. I see that as a sign of uh, strength. And if you can own up for your mistakes and own up to them in public, huge sign of strength. Um, and it's something that I'm proud of that I that I can do. Um, and that I would applaud for others to do. I mean, the, the impact that it has of someone standing up in a room and saying, hey, I made a mistake, it's on me, I'm sorry, 
and this is what I'm going to do about it. Whether it's the CEO or someone else, it, it can have just such a profound impact on the collaboration within the team. Um, and to be honest, I'd find it also very difficult to look at myself in the eyes if I didn't. That's just, the, for me, it's the only way. Yeah. And, you know, trying to hide one's mistakes, I think is, um, yeah, I mean, what a waste of life. Yeah. Um, so I, I really believe in the power of vulnerability. Yeah. I think that as a leader, you know, you need to show strength and courage, but at the same time also be vulnerable. Um, and, you know, we're all humans. We all have emotions. Um, you know, that's why when I came here, I was also quite open about, you know, I, I when I came here, I joined as chairman and then quickly became the CEO, which was temporary. And I was very open around why that was the case. I said, look, I have committed to my family that I'm not going to go into a, a, a CEO role for many years. And I explained the situation of, of the health in my family. And people thought that was incredibly brave. But I just thought it was the context required for people to understand why I was, you know, making that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's it's very rare to hear somebody say that. And I couldn't agree more. I think that vulnerability is in an authentic way, really important. Um, but it's still, I think, pretty <laughs> rare to, to hear senior leaders be vulnerable to, to be open about it. So I think it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's great to hear. You, you also asked like why, and I just kind of think of that. I think I've also probably found out it's a pretty good counterpart to my very competitive nature. And I think if, if you're always competitive, trying to win, and as you say, you know, sometimes in, in discussions, also maybe trying to win the discussions, I've learned that, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you just kind of counterbalancing that completely and goes a long way. Maybe I need it more than others as well. So if you, I don't know if this has been the case in any, in any of your businesses and I don't want, that doesn't necessarily have to be the, the topic, but if you come into a business where you see the culture needs to really transform, how long do you, do you feel it's realistic to, before you're likely to see any, uh, real change in the culture? What sort of length of time do you think it takes? Hmm. Interesting question. Again, I think very situational. Um, I think here at Mammoth is a good example because I, you know, we bought the business in, we took over the business in July 21. I became CEO in April 21 and handed it on, over to Heiko in September 22, so a year later. In that role as CEO, I didn't know if it would be six months or nine months or 12 months or 18 months. Um, but there's a bit of a dilemma already of kind of which changes am I going to make myself mm. and which changes am I going to leave for the next CEO for him and the new team to completely own. Um, but in, there was immediately a sense of, you know, Mammut is a business, uh, we're not a charity. We have incredible heritage. We have an incredible brand. Um, but we also need to be realistic about monetizing that. So initially, I, you know, I came in straight away with a sense of, you know, we need to make our money. We don't have a shareholder who's going to put in money every year. We need to finance our own growth and mm -hmm. we need to take control of our own destiny. Um, so that was a, an important part. I immediately also said, you know, we need to be much more customer centric. Um, I think there was a lot around, we are Swiss, we are 160 years, we are this, we are that. But that doesn't take away any need to work your ass off every day to make your customers happy. Um, and I think that change at the top can go very quickly, mm. um, but it takes much longer to get it done across the organization. Mm. And it also depends how much other changes, you know, at the time we were also, there were a lot of people changes and also as a few strategic decisions that we had taken. Um, but I think as a leader, you, it, it's healthy to be quite ambitious in your timeline um, and to put this at the forefront. Because coming back to, you know, what we discussed around the people agenda, mm -hmm. I think if, if you don't care about that immensely, why bother? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it is, I think, uh, to your point about the the age of the business, I, the age of the brand, Obviously, there's a lot of positives to that, but also potentially, 
if there's a culture change that needs to happen, maybe actually because the brand is so old and has so much heritage, maybe on some level it makes it more difficult to transform. Would you say that's the case? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, you know, uh, this may not be uh, accepted or um, celebrated by a lot of people here, what I'm going to say now, but talking about cultures, the Swiss are not known to be uh, the quickest uh, changers, uh, right? So I think that's definitely an element. Um, and I think also uh, being part of such an amazing brand definitely, and probably rightfully so, creates some arrogance. So the need for change is some people less obvious. Um, on the other hand, you have people who are athletes who are so passionate, who want to be the best and see Mammoth and its potential and think like, you know, when I came in, they were like, yes, finally, someone who's going to help us take this to the next level. So it's, it, you know, it, it went both ways. Mm -hmm. um, but I think here, um, you know, what I'd say is also is there's always going to be tough moments when you go through a transformation. And when there is a crisis, um, celebrate it. That's where you can make the biggest changes in terms of culture. Mm. When there is a real, real, and you know, sometimes you can choose to go smooth with a culture, culture change, but sometimes you can just embrace an opportunity to create a bit of a shocker, yeah. which then just kind of, you know, might be painful for a few months or however, however long it takes. Um, but can help the company further in such a shorter time frame that in the end, the overall kind of stress from that is much less than if you try to extend it over a longer period of time. So moving back to the, the industry overall, so when you think about the outdoor sports industry, what do you think are the biggest challenges it's going to face over the next three to five years? Well, I mean, the single biggest is pretty obvious. It's our, our climate and our planet. Um, that's devastating um what's happening and you know i think mammoth is doing a pretty good job at owning up to our responsibilities and probably many of our competing brands as well but it's still slow um and especially kind of in asia around the supply chain there's a lot more that needs to be done much quicker um you know so when i think about my children and grandchildren i am concerned um and I'm committed to, as Mamo, to accelerating our agenda. I think, I think, you know, I'm proud of the progress we've made over the last two years, but there's so much more to be done. So number one is definitely, um, you know, the CO2 emissions and the impact on our planet. I think weather um, is also, uh, you know, obviously rela related to that, but even this, this summer again has been crazy in so many ways, and it, and it is impacting the way we, you know, we plan adventures, perform adventures, go outside and we talk about the glaciers and seeing how they get smaller and smaller and smaller and think about the future of winter sport and skiing and all that. I think that's a that's a huge challenge. And the, probably the last one is geopolitical. Um, between the stresses around China and Taiwan and the US um, and Russia, I think that's you know that 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 is, that, that is a threat, but hopefully, uh, you know the common, um, the common needs of the bigger uh, countries will will prevail to find a, a positive way forward. What's your favorite piece of sport or outdoor gear, and it can't be mammoth, okay, <laughs> or water bike, okay? <laughs> uh, that's difficult. Um, First thing comes to mind, my, my ice axe, my okay. Petzl Goli ice axe, which is a lifesaver. Um, but one of the pieces I use the, the most often, probably the most often, is my, it's a very simple piece of kit, my naked uh, running band. So it's a waistband. Okay. That you put it around your waist and that kind of, I always have my phone in there. Yeah. And any gels and it's just a, it's, it's so much better than any other waistband I've ever run with. And I use it, well, probably five, five six times a week. And the other one would be my, my, my skis, just because they're, you know, just the, the pride of the skis and, you know, that I, I've climbed to 8,000 meters yeah. and, and I've, and I, I've always said, if I do that, it's the climbing the mountain is one thing, but skiing down is a real goal. 
so the the skis have always been a huge part of 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 the pride. Yeah. Um. So I think that those go a long way too. Okay. Okay. Do you still have the actual skis? I do. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's yeah. a good uh, a good reminder, a good memory. For yeah. Sure. If you look at them now, you think like that. Those are really horrible skis. <laughs> Yeah, but. they're still so heavy, and and they don't. They, I mean, they ski. They're horrible for skiing as well. Yeah, yeah. But that that makes, that makes me feel very old. It's twenty twenty years ago. Okay. Um, what about favorite piece of tech, hardware or software? Sure. I mean, I'm going to have to go for generative generative air. Yeah. That's um, obviously very hot at the moment. But I'm like I said earlier, I'm I'm so excited and at the same time scared mm. by the potential of AI. Um, and I've been doing quite a bit of work around it and we've started to adopt it also here at Mammut and it's incredible what that technology can be done and I really believe that that change is going to be one of the most if not the most profound changes humanity has faced ever so what one book podcast TV show film whatever would you recommend for somebody that wants to work in the sports and outdoor industry <laughs> something that you think would be particularly inspiring or insightful or helpful there's a book that i read last year which i had never heard of surprisingly um is the book uh, the book um about brooks the sporting goods brand the u.s based running brand and it's um written by the the ceo jim collins i believe uh, we might need to check that name yeah i'll check it um which is an amazing story around kind of his journey at Brooks. Um, and I really love that, that book. Uh, it's, uh, okay. that, that was a great book. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll check it and put it in the show notes. And for a lot of people, it's not on the classics. It's not on the classic list of books that people have heard of. So, no, uh, no, no. I, but I think it should be added to it. Yeah, okay. I'll make a note. Um, most valuable piece of advice you've ever received? Yeah, that was actually from one of my mentors. And um, I was facing a tough business challenge. And um, he told me, when you go into a, a challenging situation with your boss or your shareholders or whoever, um, always come in with your res resignation in your back pocket. And what he obviously meant by that is that you should always be prepared to step down if you don't find the agreement or you don't find the direction that aligns with your purpose. Um, so, yeah, I think that was a very meaningful advice. You know, obviously, sometimes you have to make compromises, but you usually know very clearly when the heart is not in it and when there's something that has to be done that you feel you can't do, then uh, don't do it. Yeah. I think it's, it's powerful advice. I think for a lot of people, they might feel it's, unrealistic but I think it depends I guess how strong you want to you know live life aligned to your purpose and values um, I think that's what it must boil down to yeah I mean I understand um, your response and clearly I am privileged um, but at the same time um, I think it's 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 an easy excuse um, and what I mean by this is when when our, our boys uh, were born, our twins, I didn't work for nearly two years. Um, I had quite a few big financial setbacks other than salaries. So there was a period where I was, I was concerned about uh, money and cash flow. Um, so I know what it feels like to have financial concerns. Um, but I also have the confidence, I guess, in myself that, you know, if needed, I will, I will be able to find income or generate it um, through various different ways. And I think it's that confidence that actually uh, gives me the, the courage to be able to come into a meeting and say, well, look, if this isn't going this way, then it's not for me. Yeah. I think it must also go back to that, what we start, how we started around that competitive nature, that drive, that discipline, the just to get it done, you know, get things done. Yeah. Um, it, I guess yeah, it just kind of circles back somehow to that. If this was the last day of your career, what message would you give your team, your team here? 
I would give the message that um, they are awesome, that I've learned so much um, from being part of this team at Mahmoud that I'm so proud of the brand and that I know that you know there are many challenges around us, particularly externally, but that if you have the right team, which I believe we have, and you have the right mindset, any mountain can be climbed. Um, and that also applies to any business mountain, you know, so take hold of the rope, wear the harness, support each other, and enjoy the climb to great heights. But if you could give future leaders in the sports and outdoor industry three pieces of advice, what would they be? Well, I think I've probably given a few already, um, maybe implicitly, but one is what we just discussed is that, you know, stay true to your passion um, and to your, I would say, emotional compass. Only do things that you really stand behind and believe in. Two is put your people first. Um, you know, there's no point in doing business if you're not proud of the people you work with and they can't be proud of you and what the company does. And three is don't give up. You know, mistakes happen. It's how you rebound from them. Um, and I run ultra marathons, and there's a rule in ultra marathons: it, it is never ever going to be a race where you don't feel horrible and want to give up at some point in time, and that's normal. But it never continues to get worse. At some point, you'll start to feel better again. You might still feel worse again, but you so have faith in yourself and, and and don't give up. Grind it out; you can do it. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I think I personally, your approach, your ability to, you know, hold your hand up when you make a mistake and, uh, and your family first approach is very inspiring. So, so yeah, so I really appreciate it. And I, I think the audience will, will also. So thank you very much. So well, thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure and thank you for coming over. It's never a bad thing to come to Switzerland, but I, I appreciate the effort, and it's re really nice having this chat. And I look forward to to hearing from the other other podcasters um, for what you're doing. It's an amazing project, so I, I'm sure there'll be lots of listeners um, and a growing number of them when this comes out. Thank you. Fingers crossed. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. We love to read your feedback, so please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks again for your support. See you soon and don't forget to subscribe.